Hi everyone, welcome to the Addiction Recovery Channel. I'm Ed Baker and I'm your host. The Addiction Recovery Channel was born out of a devotion to contribute to the elimination of stigma. And the way we planned on doing that was by having guests on the show who were based in science, based in data, based in compassion. And by bringing you accurate information, we would help you to unlearn stigma and unleash compassion. The ultimate goal, that we would together save lives. We're very privileged today to have two people with us who have spent a considerable amount of their time, treasure, and talent doing exactly that. It's my pleasure to introduce Greg Gardner and David Mickenberg. Greg Gardner is a senior policy counsel for the Drug Policy Alliance, which is a leading organization in the United States working to end the drug war, repair its harms, and build a non-punitive, equitable, and regulated drug market. Prior to his work for DPA, he practiced law as a public defender for over a decade and served as a legislative staff for several members of Congress in Washington, D.C. The Drug Policy Alliance partners with a number of Vermont-based and national organizations working to shift Vermont's approach to drugs and people who use drugs, away from a punitive approach to one focused on individual and public health. Thank you, Gray, for being on the show. Thanks for having me, Ed. David Mickenberg is a partner at the Burlington law firm Mickenberg, Dunn & Smith and has been actively involved in drug policy reform since 1997. He started his career at the Drug Policy Alliance, where he worked on political efforts to reduce the harms associated with the war on drugs, including a multi-year effort to allow Vermonters to access methadone treatment. He currently works on a variety of public policy campaigns, including an effort to decriminalize drugs in favor of a public health approach. Thank you, David, for being on the, on the show. Thanks. Yeah. Great to be here. Jordan, if you could put on that slide, please, uh, the Centers for Disease uh, Control slide. I'd like to just paint uh, a context for the viewing audience. If you, if you look at this slide, this is from the Centers for Disease Control. This tracks the velocity and the increase in overdose death in Vermont from 2015 to early 2023. If we had a graph that went back to 2010, you would see the drug overdose death toll more than quintupling over 14 years. In 2021, in Vermont, there were 217 deaths. In 2022, it appears when the numbers are finalized, there will be over 240 deaths. And in 2023, it appears uh, from data collected to date, that the numbers will eclipse 2022. What's happening in Vermont is every year we set a record, every year is worse than the previous year with everything we're doing. Now, Gray, you wrote a, uh, a commentary, to be exact, was published in the Vermont Digger on April 6, 2023, a recent commentary. And you titled it, Vermont Keeps Kicking Important Drug Reforms Down the Road. And, uh, you know, it was a scholarly article. I would recommend it to all my viewers. And I'd like to, I'd like to begin there. You know, what, 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 what are we doing in Vermont? How are we dragging our feet in Vermont? What are we not doing to um, end the war on drugs? I know that the Drug Policy Alliance, that's one of your major focuses. What are we doing in Vermont to perpetuate the war on drugs? Well, thanks, Ed. Thanks for highlighting the overdose curve, not only in the United States, but in Vermont, um, we are in a crisis. And that's what that article was about, that we're in a public health crisis. And instead of completely overhauling uh, what we're doing, instead of completely focusing all available resources on public health solutions to a public health crisis, we continue to have a, a haphazard approach. We continue to 
criminalize drug use. We continue to prohibit uh, the use of drugs in a way that pushes people into worse situations, that pushes people into more dangerous situations. Um, we continue to fail to invest in solutions like you've uh, promoted and talked about extensively here on your program, um, overdose prevention centers. Uh, Vermont has you know, you know, been slow to adopt uh, evidence-based solutions like overdose prevention centers that have been shown to be effective and safer um, around the world are in use in, mm. in hundreds of places around the country, or around the world. Um, we've been slow to adopt other solutions as well, although it's very encouraging that we've started to adopt, uh, that we've, we've gone um, heavier into uh, working on drug checking over this past year. I think there's been a greater understanding in the legislature, and we're going to talk about that, I hope, uh, that, that we need to help give people tools for identifying uh, contaminated substances and give people better information that allows them to, uh, to, to change their use in ways that, um, that may keep them safer. But yeah, the point of that article, I think, was just to highlight that we really need to be focusing all of our resources on evidence-based solutions and to stop creating more harm. Um, which we've been doing not only in Vermont, but uh, throughout the country in rejecting uh, drug decriminalization and, and continuing to think that it's some sort of radical solution when it is a very uh, pragmatic solution um, to reducing harm um, in people's lives. You know, we're, we're going to dedicate um, a substantial amount of time toward decriminalization. I'd like you first, though, to, to just dig a little bit deeper into this idea of the war on drugs. You know, for my viewing audience, what, what do we mean when we say that? What is the war on drugs? How did it start? How did we all get inundated into it? What, what, is, what is going on in our culture? You know, and, um... The, the, the drug war goes back beyond uh, it, its its more modern inception 50 years ago. Uh, there have been policies throughout o over a century in the United States that have criminalized people for what they put into their bodies. Um, and those drugs, ha those laws have come about largely for uh, racial targeting, for um, purposes that are uh, have been used, have been intended to, to marginalize people, um, to marginalize specific groups of people. Um, over the past 50 years, we've ramped that up significantly. Um, I think everybody at this point understands uh, how much uh, money and how much, how much of our resources, how much of our personnel have been put into arresting people um, into criminalizing people and incarcerating people for what they put into their bodies. Um, you know, but when, when we talk about the drug war, we're not just talking about mass incarceration. I think mm. when people think about the drug war, they think mass incarceration, and certainly mass incarceration is a huge problem. Um, we've incarcerated, you know, we have now about 2.3 2 million people incarcerated in the United States, and one in five of those are in prison for a drug-related offense. Um, we imprison more people than any other nation in the world. Uh, women are one of the fastest growing segments of the prison population in the U.S., you know, largely because of draconian drug, drug laws. Um, nearly, I think it's 45% of women in federal prison and 25% in state and local prisons uh, in jails and, and state prisons are incarcerated for drug offenses. And over half of those, have minor children. Um, so we're perpetuating harm uh, and there are cascading effects of, of this. But when we talk about the drug war, we're not just talking about mass incarceration, we're talking about all the other components that exacerbate poverty, discrimination, unemployment, yeah. poor health, um, and instability in general. Um, we've, we've created these systems within civil systems that create punishments for people in housing systems so that 
you're subject to uh, removal from housing if you're uh, alleged to have used drugs. Um, your, uh, there, there are a number of different penalties that we've built in from driver's licensing to professional licensing to um, you know, background screening that keep marginalizing people, keep segmenting people and isolating them um, from systems that provide more stability. And that's all part of the drug war uh, in, in many ways, that's that's been done by intent, with the intent to marginalize certain segments of of our communities. It's had a racially disparate impact. Um, people who are people of color and um, white people use drugs at the same rates. They sell drugs at the same rates, and yet uh, black and brown people tend to be criminalized. They are criminalized, prosecuted, incarcerated. At higher rates than than white people, um, so these are this the, the drug war is extensive and and it is not subsiding in a substantial way. It continues to be perpetuated throughout the country and and even in Vermont through arbitrary um, enforcement. You know, I think it's I think it's interesting, and I want you to jump in whenever sure. you whenever you feel uh, you 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 should, uh, David. I think it's interesting when you, you dig down into this concept of war on drugs, how profound it becomes. You know, we've all heard of critical race theory. I, for one, think somebody should begin to study critical stigma theory and see how stigma against people who use drugs has infiltrated every level of American American society. Um, we've, been, we've been taught it for at least 50 years as policy, as public policy, as political policy. And uh, to me, it's one of the main things that keeps people from, from embracing like humane efforts to help people with, with, with drug use issues. Do you care to comment on, on, on stigma or, or what we're talking, anything? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so it was interesting. I was reflecting as Gray was talking about what Vermont is doing now um, and what Vermont's not doing now. Uh, we, we've been here before when um, DPA and myself started working on uh, drug policy issues in Vermont in the early 2000s. Vermont was one of six states that uh, didn't have methadone treatment. We didn't have needle exchange. We didn't have a hub and spoke model. All these things we talk about in the naloxone treatment, buprenorphine, we didn't have any of that. And we were stuck in this drug war mentality that, um, that the folks that use, consume drugs don't deserve um, our love, compassion, and don't deserve uh, the same level of humanity that other people do. Now, what's hopeful for me about this time now, um, which was uh, reflected by the history of what happened then, is that Vermont did take affirmative steps. We were leaders in the country. We not only got methadone treatment, but we just developed a, a broad system of buprenorphine distribution. We were the first state in the country to allow for naloxone to be sold over the counter. We worked to pass one of the most, in fact, the most far-reaching Good Samaritan law, meaning people who were overdosing could call 911 without fear of prosecution. Um, and it was, it was by far a model for the rest of the country. And the way that we accomplished all that was by having folks' voices uh, impacted folks, folks that normally live in a world of stigma, mm -hmm. come forward and say, we deserve these same rights, we deserve the same protections that everyone else had, and it had a powerful impact. Um, and I see that sort of energy forming again. It's been a while since we've worked to push the envelope. Uh, we did some of that this year. We've done had some of those conversations last year in the legislature, but I, I'm encouraged by our history, even though we have more to do now um, and, and more to do around stigma, around the policies that we implement, we've been here before and we've stepped up. Uh, and so I, I feel uh, enlivened by 
uh, the opportunity to again bring back the voice of people that are impacted. And the people that are impacted aren't just people consuming drugs. It's the families, it's employers, yeah. Yeah. it's all of the people that are impacted, the children of people, and the <clears throat> ripple effects throughout society that happens yeah. when we don't give somebody their full humanity. Yeah, I mean, that, that is a, an excellent point. Coincidentally, this morning I was at a webinar with Dr. Yao Gallo. He's the equivalent of the health commissioner in, um, in, in Portugal. And he spoke about exactly what you're speaking about. The um, facilitator asked him what it was about Portugal that got them to enact, you know, progressive, humane approaches to people who use drugs, mainly decriminalization of, of drugs and decriminalization of using drugs. And he emphasized that what happened in Portugal in the late 70s and 80s was there was an explosion of drug use. And by the 90s, the early 90s, there was no one in Portugal who could say, you know, drug overdose is occurring within marginalized populations. It's those people who it's happening to. It was happening to everyone. And that caused a momentum to form in the culture that enabled these, the decriminalization of drugs and the humane approach to people who use drugs. And, and I, I know you see it. I know you see it in America today. Mm -hmm. That's what's happening. Everyone is involved in this. If it's not, oh, his son died. You know, it's, you know, my nephew died, his son. You know, it's the, you know, we're, we're, we're all involved in this. And I can feel the momentum developing that you're pointing out. There's great resistance to it. We mm -hmm. all know that. Maybe, would you, would you continue a little bit, because I know you spend a lot of time in the legislature. Sure. Would you continue a little bit with some of the advances that were made, specifically this year? Last year we had the veto of 728. Mm -hmm. The governor vetoed a bill that was designed to study overdose prevention centers. But this year, the advocates came back. Do you, do you care to elucidate that a little bit? What were some of the, the measures that were passed? Sure, yeah. Um, this year, um, many of the provisions that were included in the bill that the governor vetoed um, resurfaced in a bill H222, which was a real harm reduction focused bill. Um, there was a lot of really good elements of harm reduction, making it easier to access treatment, doing things like decriminalizing uh, uh, um, drug paraphernalia uh, or harm reduction, uh, harm reduction tools so um, people can access safe harm reduction tools. There was, uh, you know, a variety of provisions to strengthen our harm reduction laws um, and that was exciting. And uh, we also eliminated the sunset on the, the decriminalization yeah. of buprenorphine. Vermont was the first state in the country to decriminalize buprenorphine in certain amounts, uh, had a sunset on it. Um, the governor, when uh, it became law, said we wanted to study it to see what the impacts would be. And lo and behold, the impacts, all the negative impacts that people had talked about didn't materialize. Mm -hmm. And so we eliminated the sunset on that, made that a permanent um, piece of legislation. Um, as the bill made it through the process, um, we really made, I think, a, a, a tremendous step forward in line with the type of work that we were doing decades ago in Vermont, and Gray had mentioned this, around um, drug checking. And I found it interesting, I saw an article today that the uh, Biden administration is now launching a new policy, and I haven't seen the details, Gray may know more about it, um, related to uh, xylazine and fentanyl. Mm -hmm. And for those that don't know, xylazine uh, is a animal tranquilizer that's added to fentanyl to stretch out uh, the length of the effects of fentanyl um, with very uh, potentially dangerous impacts on people that yeah, consume yes. it. So, um, the, but part of what the national uh, platform that the Biden administration had come forward with was increased access to testing. Mm -hmm. um, and generally, the form that that's taken is testing strips. So fentanyl testing strips or xylazine testing strips to see whether or not there are uh, those substances in the drugs you're consuming. What we did in Vermont, modeled under a, a pilot program that was being done in southern Vermont, was 
we passed a law that was included in H22 yeah. to provide not just access to drug checking services where there, you can bring your drugs to get tested by machines that will give you everything that's in um, in the drugs for your own protection. Um, not just uh, the authorization of that, but we provided criminal immunity for people to bring their drugs in. We said, we value your life more than arresting you for having a small amount of drugs yeah. on your possession. We provided criminal immunity for the people testing the drugs, um, similar to what we would be talking about for overdose prevention centers. Yeah. Yeah. And we also, in the provisional law, allowed for the dissemination of information to the community to say that in an anonymous way that we can say if we find find drugs that are contaminated, we're going to let you know so you can be safe and we're also going to put out uh, information in the community. And the best part of it for me is that we took money um, from the opioid settlement <laughs> funds um, and used uh, that money uh, to pay for this so that we can have these machines throughout the, throughout the state. And to me, that's a really major accomplishment uh, that the and major step forward that the legislature took. Um, and the coalition, which I think we can talk about, was sort of instrumental in making that happen. And so, very Absolutely. exciting. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, can, I can, I, can I jump in on that real quick? I, I think oh, yes, go ahead. One of the things about this drug checking provision that I think is so significant is exactly what David said. I mean, it really prioritizes the health and safety of the individual as well as the community safety, getting information out to the community like we would do in, in, in a TB outbreak or in you know, COVID tracing. You know, we try to get information that helps us identify where the threat is and, um, and try and help people make choices that are better for them, um, that, that help them live in a safer way. Um, but that, that premise of trying to focus on the health and safety of the person is central to harm reduction. It is central to shifting toward a public health model that gets away from, as you put it, you know, focusing on stigmatizing people, focusing on you know, criminal sanctions, the threat of criminal sanctions um, that, that, that cause people to use in, in more uh, dangerous ways and, and perpetuate the overdose crisis. Um, so I think it's a really important step, and I think there's there's similar provisions um, that that need to be incorporated into some of the other uh, harm reduction measures, like overdose prevention sites. Um, the, the legislation would have similar uh, provisions to to ensure that people are not going to be criminalized. That we're we're emphasizing open doors. We're encouraging people to come in uh, to harm reduction sites by saying you're safe here. You're not going to be arrested if you come in here. Um, and by shifting that focus um, in, in this specific way with drug checking, I think we make a step in the right direction in terms of reducing stigma. Um, I would like to go back to your question about stigma, if that's okay. Oh, yes, of course. Absolutely. Um, you know, you asked about stigma and, and how um, things are progressing in, in Vermont. And I, I think that there is a greater understanding in Vermont and throughout the country um, of addiction as of the nature of addiction as a, a medical condition of substance use disorder as a medical condition as a chronic medical disease um, that that is involving the brain circuitry you know i, I think there's a better understanding of that um, there's an understanding by the health department um, mm -hmm. and i think their messaging is very clear in vermont that stigma is a problem i, I think it's actually somewhat perplexing that the department of health has a major campaign. They have a proactive effort to destigmatize drug use. They have an entire section of their website dedicated to ending addiction stigma. Um, I think it says on there, together we can end addiction stigma. Um, to me, one of the most significant forms of stigma is caused by the criminal legal system, yeah. by arresting people, by publicly shaming them, labeling them with a criminal record that goes on for years that can last a lifetime. And um, you had Nora Volkoff, the director of um, the National Institute of Drug Abuse on your show. Um, uh, director Volkoff has written extensively about the impacts of, of yeah. stigma on people's lives and about yeah. criminalization and the effect of criminalization on people's health. Um, 
if I can read one of her quotes, I think it's just very uh, poignant. It's that punitive policies around drugs mark people who use them as criminals. And so that contributes to the overwhelming stigma against people contending with an often debilitating and sometimes fatal disorder, and even against medical treatments that effectively address it. And stigma has major negative impacts on health and well being, which explains why only 18% of people with drug use disorders receive treatment for their addiction. Um, I think that kind of sums up why decriminalization or moving uh, criminal penalties is just so important. Um, and there are so many other impacts of the harms of criminalization that, that, that we can get into. But, but in terms of the stigma, I think we just need to get over the hump of realizing that, that the criminalization, the prohibition in, in general of saying that, you know, you are, uh, you're reprehensible, you are to be labeled as, you know, with a criminal penalty, if you, if you use a substance in an illicit way. Um, until we start to realize the damage that that's doing, you know, we can't truly address um, all the harms that are occurring. You know, that's um, eloquently put and, and accurate. And we, 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 we couldn't be more on point addressing this on the show today. Well, just to reiterate Nora Volkov, in another article, she tells a vignette of a, a gentleman in Puerto Rico um, with a xylazine sores, sores, soft tissue infection caused by the injection of, of xylazine, which you mentioned early, earlier. And the, the, the man is in, in danger of having to have his leg amputated. And she's with him, and she's trying to get him to come into the medical center for medical care, and he refuses medical care. And the reason he refuses medical care is to avoid the indignity of stigma. And this is what we have in America. We have an entire population of people who are literally about to die with very severe drug use disorder, injecting lethal, unregulated drugs, who are alienated from our systems because our systems have searched them, handcuffed them, incarcerated them, and stigmatized them for decades. This is the population. When you both mention harm reduction, my heart jumps for joy because this is the population that harm reduction is just so uniquely set up to embrace. Non-judgmental, unconditional safety. Come to us as you are. We'll meet you where you are. We're not going to make any demands on you. And I agree with you. I think, I think America is funny. We're making progress in different levels, in different places. It's kind of haphazard. But basically, the next logical step is decriminalization. So, Gray, I wanted to ask you, I know that you're involved on a national level. What are, what are you seeing nationally in other states? Or is there any state that we should be looking at that's saying, well, this is what they've done. We should try to uh, replicate that as closely as possible. Well, I think there's a, a movement toward uh, reducing the harms of criminalization throughout the country. I think there is a, a movement uh, that people realize. I mean, national polls show that 66% of people agree that we shouldn't be criminalizing people for, for substance use. Um, uh, the numbers are way higher here in, in Vermont. You know, it's 84% of people think that... Uh, drug use should not be criminalized. Possession of low level amounts of, of drugs should not be criminalized. Um, it's astounding and it's a bipartisan, um, it's a bipartisan agreement on the issue um, in, in many ways. So, I, so yeah, I think that um, there is a movement around the country to, to really change the way we're doing things. Um, Oregon is the best example, of course. Um, the DPA had worked with partners, allies in, in, in 2000 to work toward uh, the implementation, the, the passage and implementation of a ballot measure in Oregon that would decriminalize low level possession of all substances. Um, that passed by a strong majority in 2000. Almost 60% of Oregon voters supported it. 
And the measure itself uh, not only eliminated low-level criminal penalties, but it also provided for shifting significant funds into uh, woefully under-resourced treatment and harm reduction systems. Uh, they made available in, in the first two years over $300 million um, to invest in expanding behavioral health networks throughout the state. And they also recaptured um, upwards of, in the, in the first uh, period they've, they've assessed, they recaptured uh, over 40 million in uh, funding that was going to law enforcement um, that was freed up by the ballot measure. So Oregon's the best example of, of trying to make uh, resources available in a better way and to get remove the barriers of criminalization that prevent um, people from getting connected with services. Uh, uh, since that passed in 2000, we saw uh, in 2020, we saw significant efforts around the country to try and do uh, similar things. Uh, we've seen legislation throughout New England, through Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New York, Maine. Um, there are states throughout the rest of the country as well, Washington State, uh, Kansas, Kentucky, Texas. I mean, you see decrim bills all over the country. Um, and there's serious consideration of, of these measures in a lot of different places. Um, but, but up north, you know, in Canada, I think is one of the best examples. Canada, uh, as you know, um, just, well, Vancouver, um, in the in january of this year implemented um by waiver from the national health authority uh an emergency measure to decriminalize low levels of all substances nice. and uh, also to invest heavily in harm reduction and treatment addiction services um, so they have done what what other states should be looking toward is addressing this as a public health emergency as an emergency that affects all of us when you see uh, fatality rates like you showed at the beginning of this program, I think all policymakers should start to realize that the number one priority should be to stop causing harm and to get uh, resources to addiction services treatment um, as quickly as possible. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Can I, can I just add one thing? Of course. Yeah. I mean, it's just, I think about as Gray's talking, as you're talking, I would think about, imagine uh, another, uh, um, one of the most deadly drugs in the country, um, nicotine. Mm -hmm. And imagine that uh, instead of doing what we've done, which said, let's educate to try to bring rates of nicotine use. Mm -hmm. youth rates down, which has been effective here in Vermont. Mm -hmm. Let's talk to people about harm reduction. Let's offer alternatives to smoking cessation and things like that. Instead of doing that, imagine we said, we're going to put people in prison for yeah. smoking cigarettes. Yeah. We're going to put people in prison for drinking alcohol. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, when we're talking about drugs, we, it's good to put it in the context. I don't see any legislation around the country to make alcohol illegal, mm -hmm. cigarettes illegal. There are harms associated with both of them, serious harms, but the harms associated with the illegality and the criminalization are so significant that um, that, that wouldn't be contemplated. And so I think just sort of piggybacking on what Gray was saying, looking at these policies within the framework of is what we're do doing causing more harm? And I think the evidence shows that it clearly is. Mm -hmm. Um, so Ab absolutely, and yeah. thank you for for that perspective. I think that harm reduction uh, perspective is absolutely essential, crucial. I wanted to just note that both of you have alluded to sort of strands of decriminalization in Vermont, uh, residual uh, drugs uh, at drug testing. Yep. Um, there was uh, um, of the uh, Good Samaritan laws. Yep. You know, so, so it looks like we have the beginning, we have some budding ideas, some budding acceptance of yeah. decriminalization. I think maybe it's time to talk a little bit about coalition building in sure. Vermont, what you've been doing in Vermont, and what your sense is of the momentum yeah. in Vermont toward eventual decriminalization. Yeah. Well, that's great, yeah, and in fact, uh, Gray had been mentioning bills all over the country, Vermont, um, has decriminalization uh, legislation that was put in. There's two bills, H-423 is in the House, S-119 in the Senate. 
we had 47 sponsors of the House bill, which is, I think, probably the most in the country. A uh, number of legislators from all over the, the state with different perspectives coming together to say that the current system has failed. We need to move towards a public health model. It was really inspiring. In the Senate, we had 11, over a third of the Senate said, um, that this policy that we currently have is no longer working. So we're seeing a lot of uh, growing conversations and growing support um, for this effort. And a lot of that is due to the growing coalition. Uh, Gray and I, you and others, have been working together over the last two or three years to bring a variety of different groups together. We have our harm reduction groups, we have criminal justice reforms group groups, we have women's groups, we have the, you know, the Burlington FC soccer, FC Green Soccer Club, you know, <laughs> a lot of different types of folks seeing that um, it's an organization called Decriminalize Vermont and um, folks seeing that the current, uh, the, the current policy has failed. This, this, it's not really an organization, this group of, this collaboration of folks coming together um, started with just a handful of groups and now has grown to over two dozen groups and yeah. growing. Yeah. Um, and so, for instance, when we <clears throat> were talking about the drug checking piece, that wasn't included in the House Pass version for a variety of reasons. We held a press conference with this coalition of groups and brought really poignant stories uh, to the forefront. People were saying, we can no longer accept that um, we are going to have to go blindly and tell people that they just get what they get and uh, you know whether they die it doesn't matter to us and that coalition came together and forcefully said that we need change and that change happened mm -hmm. so it was really encouraging and i think this is going to be a growing movement because as you said it's based on data science it's based on compassion and love and it and it touches everyone absolutely and that, i think that's the key Ed, is it, it touches everyone i mean not only to a majority of people have some connection to this issue. They know somebody who's overdosed. They know somebody who suffers from substance use disorder. Um, but also, I think people from different political backgrounds and different uh, ideologies, I mean, have a, mm. a, a coherent interest in this particular issue. The harms of criminalization uh, affect us in so many ways, not only from, you know, the, the overdose issue, but to the compassion toward other people, the providing assistance to other people, the civil liberties. Um, I, I think there are a lot of people who, who are starting to realize that the harms uh, of criminalization are so broad that it's just not worth it anymore. It never was effective. It never uh, affected the rates of substance use. It never affected uh, the price, it never reduced the supply. Um, it hasn't been effective for over 50 years. And people are starting to realize that as well as seeing how much harm is created. And I think the overdose issue is particularly salient. I mean, when it, it, is, uh, it is the third leading cause of death in custody. You know, when you put somebody in a jail who is suffering some, from substance use disorder, they are at greater risk uh, than outside of the jail in many ways. Mm -hmm. uh, one study found that naloxone was administered in only 20% of fentanyl-related overdoses uh, in jails and prisons that, that were studied. Um, and about 40% of, of deaths occur within the first seven days of someone's admission into a jail. So even if you think that, hey, people aren't getting significant amounts of time, you know, they're just being uh, put into a jail until, you know, they can go see a judge or something like that. You're still putting people in danger. Um, but beyond the overdose uh, risk, the increase of overdose risk, both in jails and outside of jails, you know, in the first two weeks of release from, from uh, prison, from incarceration, individuals are almost 13 times more yeah. likely to die than yeah. the, the general population. Yeah. I think that should alarm people. Um, it should alarm people that what we're doing with the criminal justice system is just not helping connect people with treatment. It's not helping people connect with services uh, that they really need to help stabilize their life. Yeah, um, I, I, The harms I just... are, are so vast uh, when you talk about housing, when you talk about mm -hmm. employment impacts, uh, when you talk about social impacts, mental health impacts, 
um, an arrest is uh, just an arrest, not a conviction, is associated with a 12 to 14 percent decline in, in mental health. Um, so you have increases in PTSD and depression uh, and suicidal ideology. Um, there, there are a number of impacts on individuals and on people within the community that are heavily policed as well. Um, there, there are so many different things that I think, I don't know if we showed the, the graphic um, of all the various harms of criminalization uh, from you know, the erosion of our constitutional rights, our Fourth Amendment rights, uh, to the increase in militarized policing that, that have accompanied uh, criminalization, to the housing impacts, um, there are so many different aspects of this that I think should alarm people and should grow this coalition uh, in, in different ways. But a much broader movement for, for reform is growing. You know, I wanted, did you want to see that? Did you want that graph up? That would be great. Yeah. Uh, Jordan, can I you put that graph up? Which was it on the effects of uh, criminalization? Was that it? Yes, I think that's it. I think that just gives people a, a sense of the many different ways that that people are impacted, um, that our communities are impacted, that 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 harm is great being created by our policies, um, and to no beneficial effect. You know what? Elaborate you know, elaborate on it, and I'll have Jordan, uh, you know, put it up when she puts the show together. But you can elaborate on it now. <clears throat> sure. Um, yeah, I think, I think people tend to think that people are not heavily criminalized for drug use anymore. Um, but it, I think the numbers don't bear that out. I think that there are still many, many people who are criminalized uh, for drugs in, in Vermont and beyond. Um, initial data that we have shows that 15% of arrests um, in 2021 were for drug-related offenses. Um, that number, that percentage has held fairly consistent. It's been around 14, 15% uh, for the past uh, four or five years. That's still a huge investment, not only in terms of uh, uh, police resources, but financial resources on strain on the court system. Um, it, is, uh, it is a huge waste and it is a huge impact on the community that is just unjustifiable. Um, the racial disparities, we haven't even talked much about the racial disparities here, but the impacts, you know, have been tracked in, in Vermont. Um, people of color are far more likely, 18% more likely to get a sentence of incarceration um, in Vermont than similarly situated uh, white people um, mm -hmm. and uh, more likely to be criminalized in the first place. So there are, um, there's still a significant amount of criminalization that goes on. And uh, I can tell you many different ways that the system was failing. Uh, certainly in my practice, when I was working in, in the District of Columbia, you know, I saw an extensive amount of, of wasteful and harmful prosecutions of these types of cases. And I, I believe it still continues. Once again, bringing information like this uh, to the general public who are by and by inundated with false information supporting stigma is absolutely essential, I think, uh, to what we're doing. So I want to I wanna thank you for that. And Gray, I want to I wanna underline a term that you used. You used the term alarmed. We should be alarmed. And it's this kind of information when people hear it, they are alarmed. And instead of being soothed by this rhetoric about how great we're doing, they feel a sense of urgency. People coming out of jail are 10 times more likely to overdose than people who are not incarcerated. What is that about? What can we do about that? How come we're putting so many people in jail just for using drugs? People begin to ask themselves those kinds of questions. And then, in my experience, if you can connect with them, they begin to ask you, you know, what can I do? If you, if you would ask me about the population in Vermont, the regular citizenry in Vermont, 
I think everyone is either aware or unaware, but at the, either they're aware or unaware, but what they're feeling is a tremendous sense of grief and a tremendous sense of responsibility. Everyone has been watching death in Vermont accelerate in velocity over the past 15 years, and nobody knows what to do with, to about it. So people, people like you, leaders in our state, who are out here engaging people, giving us a place to go where we have someone to follow that we can trust in. You know, I just want to express my gratitude uh, to you. I want to I want to tell the viewing audience that if you have a pencil or a pen, jot down drugpolicy.org. So drugpolicy.org. That's the site for the Drug Policy Alliance. Now. I went on to the site, and I was, you know, messing around, going to this place and that place. And on the site, there's one area that says, do something. Now, this, is a, this to me is incredible. When you tap do something and you get to that part, it has a, a box for people in Vermont to join uh, an advocacy push toward de decriminalization. You, you put in your identifying information and hit submit, and a letter gets sent to all your representatives relative to this particular issue. I did it, and within, within a half day, I had received two responses from state senators thanking me for my input. So this, to me, is, is just, I want everybody in Vermont to know about it, because People in Vermont, we want to do something, and regular people don't know what to do. So along those lines, what are, what, what, what's in, what are the coalitions? Are the coalitions reaching out? I know that we're having, um, just for the viewing audience again, we'll, we'll be having a demonstration on the State House lawn on August 31st, which is International Overdose Awareness Day, from 5 to 7 in Montpelier on the State House lawn with guest speakers on issues, letting you know what's going on and what can be done. There will be uh, uh, members of the coalition that you can join there. So I think it's time, really. The time is ours. We have to really seize the moment. Yeah, I agree. I think um, doing things like contacting your legislators, telling them that whether it's a specific piece of legislation or just generally the need to do more, I think that's essential. Mm -hmm. Talking to local leaders, your local council people and others um, in your community, talking to law enforcement officials, engaging in dialogue with law enforcement, whether it's our attorney general mm -hmm. or your local police and saying, well, do you think this system is working now? Is it working for you mm -hmm. as a law enforcement official? Is it working? Has it worked for the last 52 years? of the war on drugs, why don't we start a conversation about that? Mm -hmm. I think in Vermont we're lucky enough to be small, so small enough to be able to have those conversations throughout communities and that's how we're going to uh, uh, help change policy. I mean right now, you talked about legislation, H72 is a bill related to overdose prevention centers, which you and others have been very involved in. That bill came out of its first committee and its second committee, it's in its third committee and the appropriations committee waiting for action. I mean, that is an immediate step that can be taken to save lives. If we were able to get that through the House and the Senate next year, we have communities, Burlington and other places, willing to step up and set one of these up. This is being done around the world. It's being done in um, New York City right now with On Point. There's lots of stories about it. Over a thousand people, uh, almost a thousand people, probably more than that, lives have been saved since they've opened those doors. Yeah. Yeah. People who are father, fathers, mothers, sisters, brothers, grandparents who are now living to uh, you know continue their lives and to work towards uh, stabilization. Um, that wouldn't have happened if they uh, didn't have that opportunity. So uh, there's a lot that can be done immediately and we can continue to voice to our leaders the need to make change. I mean, I, I couldn't agree with you both more and, and to hear you 
you know, speaking about advocacy with the enthusiasm that you have, there seems to be a critical mass being developed in Vermont now. We're kind of at a tipping point. Yeah. I, I watched it at the opioid um, abatement um, funds committee. Uh, that, that committee, as a result of advocacy, both inside the committee, and I know, Gray, that you wrote a very um, poignant letter to the um, uh, Commissioner of Health, on that committee advocating for overdose prevention centers. I watched advocates on that committee fight for six to seven months, and as a result, 100% of opioid funds was allocated to harm reduction. Mm -hmm. Now, they dragged their feet a little bit on overdose prevention centers, but the health commissioner put in writing that he would be looking at overdose prevention centers uh, during this phase of the process. Mm -hmm. They've already had one person come and testify, uh, Brandon Marshall, who is a, a national expert from Rhode Island, a researcher. He came and testified. They're going to have Kaylin C., who is the senior project director at On Point, come and testify. This committee now, you know, with the help of outside advocates, needs to put pressure on leadership to support opioid abatement funds mm -hmm. moving into supporting overdose prevention centers. It's happened in Rhode Island, has done it. There's a precedent. It can be done. This is one of the areas that we really need to focus attention. I think if we had um, folks pushing the Department of Health mm -hmm. and the Department of Health would actually have an honest conversation about the science associated with overdose prevention centers, harm reduction centers, um, and the Department of Health would be supportive of this, we would get this legislation passed without a, without a lot of problems. I agree. Yeah. I agree. You know, um, uh, we're, we're yeah. going to be close. We're going to be closing soon. Greg. <clears throat> and I was just going to add, uh, we we are engaging a lot of different groups on these issues, and I think we're having conversations like we're having today uh, with people in different constituencies, different backgrounds, who represent different groups of people. Um, and, and also people just from different backgrounds to, to learn more about uh, why these issues are so important, to, to learn more about the specifics of, of how criminalizing is uh, negatively impacting uh, the overdose crisis and, and impacting our lives in general, um, and to learn how uh, some of these solutions have been effective throughout the world, particularly overdose prevention centers, uh, DPA works in a lot of different states throughout the country, and we are seeing a lot of energy throughout the country for building networks of harm reduction centers, um, similar to what was what was done in New York, where the focus is really on the individual's health and safety, um, and helping connect people to services uh, in a voluntary way when they're ready and as they build trust, yeah. instead of creating uh, less trust. And less uh, and, and more difficulties, more barriers in people's lives. So I think we are engaging a lot of different groups. Uh, I think one example is is the health communities. David mentioned the health department, uh, but I think people should be aware that in other parts of the country, even the the like the medical uh, the Minnesota Medical Association just passed a resolution in support of decriminalization. Mm -hmm. There are many other uh, professional associations now that have stepped out and said you know, we should end uh, criminalization of substance use because it's ineffective and, and is, is harming uh, the people that we care about. And particularly with health professionals who are devoted to doing no harm, uh, this seems to be something that we should start to think about more seriously. Thank you, thank you. And uh, you know, m more and more, um, it becomes really a matter of professional ethics for people in various fields to step up and adhere to ethics and support what's based in compassion and support what's based in, in science and data. I want, I want to thank you. Gray, I want to thank you. David, I want to thank you. Thank you. For being on the show and, and really kind of like pushing the ball forward. Well, you pushed it forward today, and I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. I want to, um, I'd just like to uh, kind of rope you into uh, another show um, closer to the legislative session. Um, on decriminalization over, and overdose prevention centers, maybe with a, uh, like a choice panel to join two or three other significant others in Vermont that can address this
closer to the legislative uh, session. I want to. I want to just. Um, I want to thank my guests for tuning in. I want to remind people, drugpolicy.org. That's the Drug Policy Alliance workshop. Go there. It's like a diamond mine, and there's all kinds of things. There's ways to learn and ways to participate. In closing, also the event, International Overdose Awareness Day gathering on the State House lawn, August 31st, from 5 to 7. Um, we're uh, uh, joining a Team Parenting Vermont, which is a group of parents who have tragically lost children to overdose death. So come there and stand in solidarity with us and demonstrate, demonstrate your concern. We want to show, we want to show the governor, uh, the health commissioner, we want to show everyone that we're concerned about what's happening, we're alarmed about what's happening, we want more being done. So thank you. Thank you, Ed, for bringing us on the show and doing everything that you're doing to, to raise awareness of these issues. And I would just add the one other resource is the decrimvermont.org website, which has a tremendous amount of additional resources as well and information about many of the efforts that we're doing, the poll that we discussed today, um, and, and many other aspects of the legislation that have, have been uh, put forward. So Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for remembering that. Thank you.